Okay, go ahead. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Uh, okay. Um, first of all, question from last week. Um, so this is uh, the question, and I tried to answer as best as I could. Um, the first question is, um, what are, what are the general method and what approximation for solving the, say, the feed hyper model? So generally, there's no good method uh, for that is for the whole range of U and T and N. But the simplest thing you can try to do is just the mean field approximation. And this is still a good approximation. People will benchmark against once they find uh, the new method. So for example, this is the one of the early study in, in the mid 80. They tried to study the magnetic phase diagram of the Hubble model. So as we talked about last week, essentially the simple things is you try to factorize the interacting term, uh, which is original four operator term to two operator term. And for example, this is this is what this paper do. They basically break up the end up and down to end up expectation value time end down plus end up time end down expectation value. So this is one of the way to break down the interacting term. And you can assume that different uh, value of this mean field, NI up expectation value and NI down expectation value. For example, you can assume this is parametric, which is uh, no magnetic ordering, or ferromagnetic, or even anti ferromagnetic. So, and you do that, basically you just uh, substitute those expectation value as a C number into the into the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian being quadratic. So in principle, you can solve it by hand. Uh, Sometimes you may not be able to solve it by hand, but you can solve it by computer for fairly large system size. This is the phase diagram they get, for example, for the, this is not for the 3D, if I remember, there's a 2D Hubble model. Um, so essentially they get the main feature you expect to see, for example, close to, I think this, uh, they have put a T pi there. It's not only nearest neighbor hopping, they're also next nearest neighbor hopping. So for very small value of U, they, you don't, they don't see anti ferromagnetic ordering. Uh, if T pi is zero, that means the hopping is, is strictly nearest neighbor. You will see anti ferromagnetic all the way down to U zero, which I'm going to talk a bit about why you expect to see anti all the way down to U0. But this is the case for T pi, not U0. So you see a very small U, even a half filling here. Uh, you get a parametric phase. The system is not magnetized. But once you go up to U, you get anti all the way. <coughs> uh, another feature we talk about with Hubble model is for very large U and uh, low doping you expect to see ferromagnetic. So you see a stronger, stronger interaction. The ferromagnetic phase get closer and closer to the half building. This is kind of consistent to the, the Lakaoka field one we talked about. Uh, if you recall last week, this uh, the proof if you go infinity and you only have one hole in the system, that means it's only one electron adopted from the half building you get ferromagnetic sum. Um, and then the trend is seem to be the ferromagnetic sum going, the area for ferromagnetic sum going closer and closer to the half field case. Um, this is this is one of the methods which solve the Hubble model. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the method uh, later in this talk, but in general, there's no good method. That's why we, we we have the dynamical mean field theory. This is another way to solve the Hubble model. Uh, we can try quantum Monte Carlo um, for half field Hubble model, which is particle symmetric. The quantum Monte Carlo doesn't have any minus sign problems, so you can solve the model to fairly large system size. 
say for example, I think people have sold more than thousands of sites for hot, hot field Hubble model at very low temperature. Um, and you can obviously do exact diagonalization, uh, pretty much a limit to a one trendy side with state of the art imp implementation, maybe trendy something, but not much more than that. Um, for 1D mostly, you can, there are, there are more options. 1D, you have the exact solution, but the exact solution only Normally, it doesn't give you the correlation function, even if you have the exact solution, but gel gate correlation function, spectral function is still very challenging. Uh, 1D, you may have a couple other more methods like the MLG or related matrix called a state method. But in general, for 2D or 3D, there's no general method which can solve this problem. Maybe other people may know more about it than me. So. Is that good enough answer for you? I don't know. That's good. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the other question is when we say we solve the Hubble model, does it mean we find the density of state as a function of T and U or something else? Um, well, not always the case when someone say I solved the Hubble model that could be one of the situations they find a special function or density of state. But usually when they say they solve a Hubble model, they don't mean they find a wave function. Um, very rare that's the case, except when people do, for example, variational Monte Carlo, that would be one of the few cases people actually try to calculate the wave function. Uh, most of the time we don't. And sometimes, People say when they solve the Hubble model, they probably just mean I find the ground state energy. Uh, and that is. But normally, because you want to connect to the experiment, ideally, is, uh, the two, co two different quantities are important. One of them is spectral function, obviously, which is can measure directly in the R press, uh, another spectroscopic method. The other is the susceptibility. This is actually measure the response function of the system. So this is spectral function is basically a single particle green function and the susceptibility is a two particle green function. Of course, you can also calculate higher order green function, but it's not routinely been done because that's not easily accessible in experiment. Um, is there any follow up question on this? Anyone? Yeah, Hannah just mentioned that uh, the solution means that we found the green function and self energy. Yeah, when people do DMFT, that usually what they mean. So, uh, so I have just one question. Uh, so, when people solve Hubbard model by exact diagonalization, what quantity they look? Uh, they actually have the ground state wave function usually. Okay. Because um. Wow, when they say exact diagonalization, it's not like you put the matrix in the into a lab pair routine. Okay. When you put in a lab pair routine, you you full diagonalize the matrix. That's normally what what people mean when they say they do exact diagonalization for the Hubble model. It also means they find the they use some kind of Q lot or projection method, uh, -huh. uh like Lenzos. That that's the most common method people use, which only find find the ground state or feel low lying inside the state. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It, where it's not common people will fully diagonalize the matrix because that will be limited to I want ten thousand a few ten of thousand by a few ten of thousand matrix size, that would be I want twelve size again. Uh actually for people doing uh uh, non equilibrium case or uh, many body localization, they may they may need to fully diagonalize the matrix sometime. Okay. Because they want to find all the all the spectrum. But most of the time, just mean we find the ground state only or feel low lying inside the states. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. Uh, to construct a matrix for 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 a Hamiltonian. You yeah. need a, a basis, right? Uh, so what yes. kind of basis people usually choose? 
Well, because they do hopper model, the base is very natural, right? It's just a local one here, basis. Okay. Okay. This, this is on more than level. Uh, 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 okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. Any more question? No. Okay, then. Okay, I combine these two questions together because question number three is in practice, how do people determine their T and U? I think I think I leave this to with Sim in the future to answer this question. Um, yeah. Maybe with Sim can say something for now. I don't know. Uh, yeah, so uh, so message I am uh, taking from your talk that uh, you have mentioned here U and T as a free parameter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so but I, I'll, I'll take from there. Uh, yeah. Okay, so you you talk about it in your talk in the future. Yes. Right? Okay, yes. yes. So I, I leave it to you because I don't want to say something not correct. <laughs> um, so question number four is I, the value of U and T is an indicator of electron, electron correlation. Is there a general rule that wants the value of U? or u over t beyond certain threshold value, the system is considered to be strongly correlated. What is the threshold value? So roughly, largely speaking, you can think about u is interaction, so you crank up the u larger, then the system will be more correlated in a sense. Okay, then we need to quantify what, what, is, what is correlation. What, 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 strong, what kind of physics it will get by strong correlations? Um, yeah, let, let, let's put it this way. For for example, for 3D system, for 3D systems, yeah, the electrons are, are not really strongly correlated. But if you go to like a uh, yeah, so uh, imagine or, you, or, yeah, what kind of you and the get uh, for yeah, like imagine you start from you start from 3D Hubble model. Let's say for, let's say half filling. Um, you you turn on the U, the system will immediately become anti-ferromagnetic at zero temperature. Um, at least I believe that will. Um, so then the correlation need to a broken symmetry. So this is one of the possibility. So when you turn, what value of you will give you a phase transaction, which is not give you a metal insulated transaction. Or give you some kind of some kind of ordering. In the Hubble model, that will be anti-ferromagnetic ordering. If your Hubble model is half filling on a cubic lattice, let's say, then the system will go to broken symmetry state for po possibly pretty much infinitesimal value of u. So then at that case, you can say you will lead to strong correlation even before very small value. Now, but in, in the other situation, let's say your your system is highly doped or density of uh, the electron density is very low. So the electron is very far apart from each other. Then you the system still remain metallic at very large value of U. So in this case, the value of you have to be very large to make the system to have qualitative change. So in the other word, the system remain fermi liquid. Um, so one of the definition of fermi liquid is what I wrote here. It's the basically measure part of self energy is scale with either the frequency square or temperature square. Um, so essentially, the system is still become met still metallic, even U is very large. The other possibility, the system may be metallic, but the self energy doesn't scale like what I wrote in this equation. That means the self energy doesn't scale like omega square t square. So you can also call it that's the effect from the strong correlation. So, so the question may be. We should ask is what kind of value of U or density, what kind of combination of those parameters that will give you a deep physics different from metallic phase, I guess. And that will depend on 
on the different value of u and n. So I I don't think it's a it's completely answer your question, but because I, I think there's no real definition of what what exactly mean by strong correlation. And uh, uh, we can also uh, visualize uh, correlation as a uh, orbital picture, like uh, from the bandwidth point of view. So if you are mm -hmm. considering uh, considering S and P orbital system, so their bandwidth is very large. And when we are considering D and F orbital system, so their bandwidth is very narrow, so they are more correlated. Yeah, but but essentially saying you you talk essentially talking about the same at U over T is small or large. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, I I, I would say is what value of U will give you physics which is different from a metallic phase. That probably would be more meaningful definition. And in this case, for half filling, you need very small value of U. But for the system away from the half filling, you need a very large value of U. If you remember when you studied the um, the electron gas problem, usually you have a parameter called Rs, which is basically a density state of the electron. Um, and how difficult the system can be studied, it depends on the density state of the electron. So, you can argue about that if the method is very good, the perturbation theory is very good for that particular system. Well, then the correlation probably is not very large. Maybe you can understand it this way. Okay, uh, any more comment? No. If, if not, then I will go to talk about uh, what I haven't finished last time. So this is uh, what we learned from last week. So essentially I have an axis here. At the bottom is U over T is zero. At the top is U over T go to infinity. Talk about this two limit, U over two go to zero and U over two go to infinity. So U over T is zero, it basically just a, a non interacting system. This is the bare dispersion, bare spectral function. Uh, I just used the K for D or infinity. In principle, for D or one or D or two, they have a, uh, they are not exactly Gaussian, but uh, we mentioned the last time when D or infinity is Gaussian. Uh, and the other extreme limit is when U or two over go to infinity, you only live with two so-called Hubble band, the lower Hubble band and upper Hubble band because the electron take energy U to get doubly occupied. So this two limit is kind of easy to understand. Then the next step is what will happen if we go from, let's say U of zero, but we crank up the, but I can crank up the U a little bit, not strictly zero, what are we going to get? And that obviously will relate to some kind of weak uh, per, we call for in perturbation theory. And the other limit is we start from the situation which have no double occupancy, uh, but we allow some hybridization between the electron. That's, that means we turn on the hopping, we turn on the T. What will happen here? So I will roughly talk about what the physics you expect for weak coupling theory and the strong coupling theory. So you can have an option which one you want to go first because I'm not sure I can finish both. <laughs> which one you want to start from a weak coupling theory first or strong coupling theory first? No opinion. Young. Which one? Which one you want to go first? Uh, strong coupling. Okay, then that, okay, let's go to strong coupling first. Um, okay, so um, strong coupling, okay. So I can see you much larger than T. Um, so before we talk about this, I want to talk about what the possible hopping process, because that is important if we consider this strong coupling limit. So I wrote down for, possible uh, combination of hopping term. 
So uh, the one on the left is before you add the hopping term, the one on the right is you, after you add the hopping term. So the case one is I have a spin up at side one and no electron at side two. So I allow the spin up electron to hop from side one to side two. So this case doesn't change the number of double occupied side or empty side because there's only one electron there. Now case two, I can see an electron at spin up at side one and side two is doubly occupied. So I have both up electron and down electron and side two. Um, then I allow the down electron from the side two to hop to side one. So after the hopping, you get a doubly occupied side at side one and only up electron at side two. So this process also doesn't change the number of doubly occupied side. It just moved the doubly occupied side at one. <coughs> so case three, I have a double occupied side at side one and empty side at side two. And I allow one of the electron, let's say the dance spin down electron from side one up to side two. So this process will change the number of double occupied side from two to six, from one to zero. Okay, it's going to be important, okay, because the U is strong. This, this process change a lot of energy and the strong component limit. So then I consider an opposite case is I have side, spin up electron side one, spin down the electron side two, and I'll, I allow the spin up electron from side one to, to hop from to the side two. Then a side one become empty and side two is double occupied. And this process change the num number double occupied side from zero to one. Okay. So this is all the possible hopping process. Uh, which is allowed for nearest neighbor hopping. So if you break down the hopping term, so I rewrite the hopping term here. So basically CI dagger CJ, sum over all the spin. <coughs> then you get this four term uh, called H2 zero, which is hopping for an empty side. H2 plus HT plus, which increase the double occupied side by one, and HT minus, which decrease the, the number of double occupied side by one, and H2, which hop for the double occupied side. Okay. Now, the next step is because we consider U much over T, what I want to do is I want to do the expansion of T over U. I, I want because now T over U become a small parameter. Uh, what the first thing I want to do, I want to eliminate some hopping pauses. So the hopping pause will change the number of double occupied side will cause a lot of energy, right? Be a double occupied side cause energy U. If you allow it, if you allow the number to change, that means you change a lot of energy of the system. I want to construct a low energy effective theory for the system, I want to eliminate those pauses. So, uh, okay, I weigh out, first of all, I weigh out the term explicitly, what what the hopping of empty side means. So basically you project out the side by this projector, one minus nj minus sigma. Minus sigma means if you're up spin, you change the down spin and vice versa. So basically the J side as the reverse the spin got to be empty for this hopping to be non-zero. So CICJ is a standard hopping term, but now I add two projector, one mm -hmm. before the hopping and one after the hopping. Basically I just project the side to make sure the side of opposite spin is empty before. Okay, and the side at, uh, and the side i is empty after the hopping. So that's why this term corresponds to hopping, uh, hopping of an of a empty side. And similarly, I can do that for hop, for changing the, the uh, increasing a number of double occupied side. Basically, I do a projection operator one minus n before hopping and n after hopping. And 
we can do it oppositely. So we do the projection first by nj, and then one minus n after the hopping. So finally, this, finally the last case, we only allow the hopping if the site is already doubly occupied. So we have the projection n and n before and after. So this is four possible hopping term we can write down. And I want to eliminate the uh, the H plus and the H minus would change the number doubly occupied sign. So what we need to do, we do the so-called shifter wool transformations. Um, this is the transformation you probably heard about if you study the Anderson impurity model or maybe sometimes uh, electron photon model like the host team model. So essentially what we do is try to construct a unity transformation uh, to, to eliminate some of term in the original Hamiltonian. Let's say my original Hamiltonian contain two terms, H equal to H lot plus some perturbation H1. H1 is something I want to eliminate. Uh, what we can do is we do a unity transformation. So this is the uh, symbolic representation of unitary transformation. Uh, exponential S time H, exponential minus S, and S is anti emission here. So I basically just expand the S, uh, exponential S. Um, I think I'm gonna typo here. This one should be a plus sign because this is S, uh, and this is my exponential minus S, so this one should be a minus sign. Sorry, swap them the side of this term and this term. So just expand exponential function and then you can be it in terms of a bunch of commutator. So the key point here is um, if you will expand the Hamiltonian, just substitute the H by the H0 plus H1, you will get the equation here. So basically uh, H0 is something we want to keep and then H1 and some commentator of S with H lot plus higher order term. Mm -hmm. So because we want to elim eliminate H1. So what we need to do is we need to find an S which make this condition being satisfied. That means H1 plus uh, commentator S and H lot to be zero. So we want to find an uh, operator S to make this condition being fulfilled. So once this condition being fulfilled, the second term will become zero. And, uh, and the third term here will also become zero. And the low, the, the now the lowest order term remaining is to is the S and H, the commutator S and H1. Okay. There's no fancy operation here, it's just some a little bit messy. Uh, manipulation of the commutation relation, standard, it just standard quantum mechanics. Um, so this is the, what the effective Hamiltonian we want to get. So we eliminate H1 by the commutator between H1 and S. And S is given by, by the solving this equation, basically. Okay, so we want to apply it to the Hubble model what well, the first step we need to do, we need to decide what the H naught, what is the H1. So H naught is the term which doesn't change the number of double occupier side. Remember the HT naught is the hopping of the empty side. HT2 is the hopping for double occupier side. HU is the Hubble term. The Hubble term is an NINJ, is a diagonal term. So it doesn't change the number of particle, it doesn't change the number double occupy side. So we set these two terms in H lot and H1 contain two terms. The first term which increase the number double occupy side by one due to the hopping and the other decrease the number occupy side by one, by one. So what we want to do is we put the H lot and H1 to the shifter wood transformation we have before. Um, this is some complicated mess. I don't even have time to, to take it. So probably, um, 
you don't need, you don't need to follow every single step here. So the idea is, uh, I want to calculate the shift wheel transformation H tilter. So why down the whole Hamiltonian here, and then all those commentators we talk about. Um, so the first term we want to eliminate is S H U. Um, to eliminate this term, you can find the S is given by one over U H T plus minus H T minus. So basically it's solving the condition I talk about. I try to, I try to find this for S to satisfy these conditions. So this is a, this is the S which can satisfy the condition. I plug it in and basically you can calculate those commutator. Eventually you will end up an equation like this. Um, it's a, I, I jump a lot of step here already, but the idea is straightforward transformation. So, and then eventually you will end up with the Hamiltonian like that. The T uh, is the hopping term, but the hopping term is more complicated than the usual one because we have a projection here, uh, one minus N at front and uh, uh, before at the front before the hopping process and at the back after the hopping process. And the interaction term become a spin-spin coupling, SISJ, and also the, um, the child coupling, NINJ. So uh, <coughs> this is so-called TJ model. And so the TJ model is essentially what we're doing is try to give try to get the lower order expansion of T over U because U over T a large parameter. We want to expand it in terms of one over the large parameter. Okay, strong coupling. This is what we get. Let's go, go back, uh, go a step back. If we are only at the half field case, in the half field case, because U is so large, then no hopping of the electron allowed it, basically because the double occupies they cost so much energy. So in the half field case, the first term is basically zero. And you only left with the second term. And in those case, because only one electron per side, so this term, the density density interaction time just become a constant because the electron charge each side is always the same for the half field case. Uh, so you left with only the J S I dot S J term. This is the usual uh, high symbol Hamiltonian for spin. Uh, from that point, you can start talking about the possible magnetic ordering. For example, the square lattice uh, or the cubic lattice, you can assume the antiferromagnetic ordering. And then when you assume the antiferromagnetic ordering, one of the simple approximation you can do is so-called a spin wave approximation, and you can calculate the, the spectral function of spin wave. You can calculate spin wave dispersion, basically, and you can get the excitation spectral for the half field case. Now, the uh, interesting- coming. Hmm? So this J is, uh, I guess it's related to U and T, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 40 square over U, actually. Okay. 40 square over U, thank you. Yeah, um, so so at half you in, you 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 get high symbol speed model. The interesting thing is what will happen when you drop the system. So suddenly there's some side become empty because the side some side is empty. The electron can hop around the empty side. So now the electron allowed to move. And, but they have still have certain restriction because the T term here is not free hopping. It's a hopping, a project the hopping. So let's say if the site is already occupied at one electron, you tend to not allow another electron to hop to that site. Right? Because it still need to pay a high energy cost. That's what this T mean. This is what the project the T mean. The the it's the it's just the hopping, but the hopping only allowed over the um, single uh, empty side. Okay, so we have the effective Hamiltonian. What we can do for half field case, we say 
it because spin Hamiltonian, you can do a spin wave approximation. You can calculate some some quantity by the spin wave approximation. But when the system is docked away from the half wave, this Hamiltonian is still very difficult to solve. Indeed, that may be even more difficult to solve than the than the Hubble model. So I just rewind the Hamiltonian here. Um, may I have just one question from last yeah. slide? Uh, so we have seen uh, Hubbard model re reduces to Heisenberg and yeah. J equal to 40 square by U. Yeah. So in that case, uh, when J equal to 40 square by U, if we think U as zero in that limit, how, how we can think of J, T and U? That... How can we think of J as a... Uh... Yeah, when U equal to zero. Uh, well, U and zero is not really the valid limit here because the whole thing is is with the assumption U is much bigger than T. Oh, okay. right. So that shift forward transformation is try to try to assume T over U is uh is small. Oh. Basic expansion of the effect of the Hamiltonian in terms of T over U. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. so that that that's not where the limit here. Uh, okay, um, so I rewind the Hamiltonian. I take out the projection operator, but we just we assume they are there because it usually what a lot of time we just ignore. It. We just don't write the projection operator explicitly, but it assumed to be there. Now this Hamiltonian is still very difficult to solve, if not more difficult. In this, you can argue this is more difficult because you don't even have a non-interacting limit. The hopping is not hopping. Uh, if you go back one side, the hopping term actually is a four operator term. So you have a hopping, but you, you also have this density operator. The density operator is also two operator term. So you don't really have a true non-interacting limit. So it doesn't like simple hopping model. You solve it in a T, you just a simple quadratic Hamiltonian. The T here is not quadratic. So there's no good starting point for the model per se. Um, the one of the common method or the most well-known method to solve the model is called the state boson mean field theory. So what the state boson mean field theory is, I try to rewrite the uh, fermionic operator C here in terms of product of a fermionic operator and a bosonic operator. So why we have to do that? The reason we want to do that is because we want to have the constraint of no double occupancy. Remember that the whole Hamiltonian is the assumption that all the side is either no electron one electron up or one electron down. It's only this three possibility. The possibility of doubly occupied project out. But analytically, it's very hard to implement this. Of course, if you want to use exact angularization, that would be simple. You just you just fold out those state which are doubly occupied. But to do any hand calculation, that would be very difficult. So one thing to do it is try to implement something like a Lagrange multiplier. If you Think about you learn the calculus, it's the same idea. You apply like one multiplier to implement some constraint. Um, what the constraint is, the constraint is I sum over, let's say I in a say I, I sum over, okay, this should be F decker F. This should be F decker, sorry. So you I sum over the fermion operator as say I for spin up and spin down, and then a bosonic operator. SAI, I should always get one. So physically what that means is the F, uh, sometimes called spin on operator is representing the spin and the B, the bosonic operator, basically counting the number of empty side. So BI dagger BI is counting the number of empty side, FI dagger FI is counting the number of spin up and the spin down electron. And the spin up electron plus the spin down electron plus the lump plus the plus the empty side and every side should always equal to one. So this is the constraint we want to implement. 
and that that's why that's why we need to rewrite this firmware on operator. We want the, the main reason we want to implement this constraint. Uh, so one once we rewrite, we can rewrite the Hamiltonian in terms of the F and B, and this is what we get. Uh, obviously, there's no simple way to solve this Hamiltonian because all the operator, all the term are interacting term. They are not, they are not no quadratic term here. And with this situation, this uh, usual thing you will solve to the mean field theory. You try to uh, make those operators become quadratics. What what uh, one can do is introduce two uh, mean field or the parameter. One of them is chi i j, basically corresponding to some bond operator, the expectation value of bond. Uh, fi dagger fj, basically the hopping operator, the bond operator. Um, and then also a single app pairing, call it delta ij. So this is basically a pair, single app pairing operator between psi i and psi j. So you substitute this mean field uh, expectation value into back to the Hamiltonian here. Then the Hamiltonian will become quadratic, like similar to the case we talked about at the beginning of the top for the Hubble model, make the Hamiltonian quadratic, and then you can solve the chi and delta. So different, then you can um, find the different value of chi and delta as a function of temperature and doping and interpret the, the different region in the, uh, in the phase, phase diagram to different phases. For example, uh, this is a very well known uh, phase diagram by Patrick Lee Lager also from early 90. Uh, the vertical acid is temperature, the horizontal acid is a doping. Uh, so at high temperature, you get this, they call it phase number four. Basically, the phase number four is sometimes we call it the string metal or the uh, non fermi liquid phase, basically. So at high temperature, but above the superconducting dome, you get something non fermi liquid. And below the, uh, uh, below the non, uh, non fermi liquid area, you get the superconducting region. Number three, basically, <coughs> the D way superconductivity, D way superconductivity region. Number one, is the Fermi liquid. Let's talk about if the, even the interaction is large, but if the doping is also very large, that means the electron are very quite far apart from each other, you still get, get the Fermi liquid. So the region one is the Fermi liquid. Region two is some spin gap phase. Um, Spin gap phase, sometimes you can interpret it as a system with no magnetic ordering, but your finite uh, spin excitation, and usually that interpret in some kind of RVB or spin liquid phase, Western valium bond phase, which is low long range. There's no long range ordering, but there's spin gap. So this is the phase diagram we can get in the TJ model. So. Let's recap the every, everything we've done. Basically, we start from the Hubble model. We do the shifter wood transformation, basically a T over U expansion because T over U is small parameter. We want to expand the Hamiltonian in terms of it. When we do the expansion, we will find out the effective Hamiltonian at half ring is a high symbol model because the electron don't allow to be doubly occupied. But one you still allow the doping to happen some empty side exit in the system and the electron can hop around the empty side. And the model is difficult to, 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 to be solved. Um, then we go back to mean field approximation. And the mean field approximation, you need to introduce some something of slave boson uh, method to, to, to uh, implement the constraint of no double occupancy and do the mean field calculation, you get this is the qualitative water phase diagram you get. So basically, you can get the most important feature of Cook Bray superconductor.
Okay. Any question before uh, this? This is the end of the strong coupling case. So, any question before it goes to the weak coupling? <laughs> Uh, I'll ask a question. Uh, so in all this analysis, you, when you consider the hopping term, you always like a spin up, hop to a spin, remain to be spin up, or spin down, remain to be spin down when it hops. Yes, is there yeah. such a case that when you do hopping and also the, the spin uh, the flips? Yeah, um, yes, in general, you can have this. Uh, actually, it's called pair hopping term sometime, or the, even the spin term will allow the spin to fit, which is just not explicitly written down because the spin term uh, will have SC and S and SY term, right? SC and SY term basically flipping the, uh, the spin. It's not hop, but it just flip the spin. But you really need hop the hop the electron from spin up to spin down, there a term called pair hopping. Okay. Yeah. It, it's not commonly studied, uh, but in principle, it allowed it. <coughs> provide that, okay, provide, provide that the, the spin number, the, the, the spin number is a good quantum number. So you have to conserve the number up and down spin. So that's why when you, when you do that, you need to do it in a pair. Okay. But if you don't just allow one spin up to flip the spin down, then the spin number is not conserved anymore. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so next step, go to talk about some weak coupling theory. Uh, that could be easier or that could be more difficult. Um, so the other lemma is a weak coupling theory. So in this case, U is much smaller than T, but non-zero. What we can do, the easier thing we can do, we do perturbation theory. So this is all the, all the diagram for the second order perturbation. The first diagram is called particle-particle diagram. Um, so Roughly speaking, you have two electron coming in and two electron coming out. Uh, so in the same direction, that's why the arrow is pointing to the same direction. And it's called particle particle diagram. And you can flip the direction of one of the arrow and then you get the particle hole diagram, like the, like the second one. <clears throat> Sometimes the, the two type of particle diagram depend on momentum transfer. This, <laughs> this particle diagram momentum transfer k phi minus k1. But there's also three other particle diagram which have momentum transfer k phi minus k2. So there are one particle particle diagram and four particle diagram. And this four diagram can be separated into two classes. Uh, this first one you can call particle one and the, the other few call particle two. Um, so what we can do, we calculate the diagram. If you calculate a particle particle diagram, that means we calculate the convolution of two green functions. Right? G, say sum over G, G P and G uh, times G K minus P, where P is a dummy variable is sum over the frequency and momentum of P. Uh, that's in the particle particle diagram. And the K is basically the uh, momentum transfer. So it's K2 minus K1 for the particle diagram here. For the particle diagram is similar. Uh, we have convolution of GP and GP plus Q and Q is a momentum transfer. Uh, for this diagram, uh, the momentum transfer K3 minus K1, momentum and frequency transfer. Uh, it's K3 minus K1. And for this free diagram, the momentum transfer will be K3 minus K2. So we have these two diagram. Uh, and if you have a speed one on perturbation theory, basically the particle particle di particle particle diagram is the proportional to the pairing susceptibility, which 
naively you can understand basically it's a pair coming in and a pair coming out. And the particle diagram is proportional to the antiferromagnetic or SDW susceptibility. Okay, then we want to understand a little bit more. We want to calculate it. It just a, here is just a definition. We want to calculate it. Um, for the for the weak coupling case, we can actually do the moment the frequency sum. This is the equation of the particle particle bubble after you sum the frequency. We didn't sum the momentum yet, so but we sum the frequency. And you get some distribution function over some uh, epsilon p minus epsilon k minus b. This is generally what you get. Sometimes you call you call lean half function. And you can do the same thing for the particle bubble. Uh, you get a similar structure, but crucially, this is minus one here. Turns out to be an important quantity. Um, the first thing we realize is if you calculate the particle particle bubble with momentum zero and frequency zero, you try to calculate this quantity, this quantity is going to be divergence, which is not surprising because roughly speaking, you can see there's a K naught here and then epsilon P minus epsilon K minus B here, the sum point at the denominator will be will be zero. So indeed you can you can do the momentum sum and find out this is divergent. Let's say in 2D, this is divergent logarithmically. Uh, this is log W over T, where W is the bandwidth of the system and T is the temperature. So what that means is if you uh, do the weak coupling perturbation theory, the pairing susceptibility will diverge at low temperature. This is what, uh, what this calculation give you. The particle-particle diagram is always divergent for k or zero, frequency zero. Now, can we can we do the same thing for the particle bubble? Okay. If we calculate a particle bubble at zero momentum, um, but finite frequency, this is zero. And that means they are not divergent. In the opposite case, if we consider the finite, finite momentum, but zero frequency, this quantity is finite, actually proportional to the denser state on the Fermi level. However, if you read carefully, there's a term, epsilon p minus epsilon p plus q here. If the Fermi surface satisfies so-called lasting condition, what the lasting condition means is if you have dispersion, the epsilon k is equal to minus epsilon k plus q. Let's give a specific example. If q is pi pi, or even you think about one dimensional k, if q is pi and your dispersion is cosine k, this dispersion satisfies these conditions for all the value of k. And this is so-called a lasting condition. And visually, if, let's say for the two-dimensional square lattice, only nearest neighbor hopping, you, you draw a vector from one side of the Fermi surface and add a vector pi pi to it, it's always collecting to the other side of the Fermi surface. So this is the lasting condition. And this condition is satisfied uh, at half filling. So this is, this is exactly correct at half viewing, uh, nearest neighbor hopping in 2D or even higher dimension. Uh, so if this condition is satisfied, you can solve the particle bubble at zero frequency at the lasting vector Q is also divergent logarithmically. Um, this is one of the reasons you can understand why the Hubble model, even at very weak coupling, Essentially, a zero infinitesimal value, small small value of u, you also get the antiferromagnetic ordering because the particle bubble basically divergent uh, with respect to the temperature. So if you go low enough temperature, doesn't matter how small your initial value of u is, the 
particle susceptibility also mean the uh, antiferromagnetic susceptibility will will be will diverge, and you get the interpretation is you the system become antiferromagnetic order then. Now the the difficulty is you both you have you have divergency more than one channel the in this case the particle particle diagram is divergent and the particle diagram is also divergent how the different channel interacting with each other so just recap everything so the parent susceptibility diverge and log log uh, w over t and the <coughs> and the anti ferromagnetic susceptibility also diverge a lot. Uh, w over t, how how this compete with each other. So remember that the log divergence of SDW only happen at at half filling. If we have a finite doping, it cut off by the chemical potential. So it's it's go quickly, but it's not completely divergent. It's not exactly divergent because it cut off by the chemical potential. Now for the weak coupling, it differs from the strong coupling case. Last week we talked about mock insulator. Um, in in this case, although we have the antiferromagnetic ordering, but you know, and we have a gap in the system, but we should interpret it in term in terms of slater insulator rather than the mock insulator. The the difference is the slater insulator mean the gap is happen because of the magnetic ordering. So for the mock insulator, you strictly speaking, you do not less than need to have an ordering in order to have a gap. But for Slater insulator, you need the ordering in order to have a gap. And for the weak coupling theory, it's so you you will have ordering. Okay, what what we can do to try to consider the competition between different channels, and this is so called the parquet theory or the or you can do it other way, functional LG theory. So instead, I consider the channel separates here. So basically, we calculate particle, particle bubble, and the particle bubble. But if we allow all these channel to compete with each other, then you may be able to see different things. And for example, this is the calculation uh, from Master group at 2000. So essentially, they, they use a functionality to consider interaction between different channels of instability. And they draw the phase diagram like that. The so vertical acid is a U over T. Uh, the horizontal acid is a chemical potential. You can interpret it as a, as a doping away from the half filling. You see, for near the half filling, you get the SDW. Uh, spin dense wave, that means antiferromagnetic ordering. Top the wave from the half wing, you get, again, you get the D wave superconductivity. So, both for the strong coupling limit, the TJ model, and the weak coupling limit, which is basically uh, perturbation theory, or we normalize in school, parquet theory, they will, they will give you a D wave superconductivity too. Um, so, and also, also the uh, spin dense way at half filling. So this some generic feature they can, you can capture either from the weak coupling and strong coupling theory. Um, of course, then more interesting thing, for example, what will happen about the D-way superconducting term? Uh, what kind of non Fermi liquid you get? Do you get something like a marginal Fermi liquid that? That's the important question. Uh, people still try to study uh, by different method nowadays. Um, so I think I think that's all I prepared today. Um, and this you can see as kind of conclusion of what you get by the weak coupling theory. Any question? Okay, thank you. Uh, mm. uh, it seems like yes, uh, all this analysis is based on a single band model. Uh, yes. But uh, uh, yeah, the question is: you see, you have like D electrons here. Uh, D electrons certainly. Uh, can it still apply single band model? Uh, 
it's, it's, it's not well, slow. No, okay, a lot, a lot of study they are targeted for. Well, both these two pieces of study I talk about today, they are both targeted for for a Kubernetes superconductor. So and and their famous paper by 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 Fu Shang and uh, Maurice Wise, they 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 claim that the the Kubernetes superconductor can be effectively described by the one band of the model, and that and that historically why most of the interests are in the one band Hubble model, sure. For example, in the a more detailed model for Cooper superconductor, you should also consider the copper band and the oxygen, the copper orbital and the oxygen orbital. So in principle, that should be a three band model. Mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, we can then consider the, the energy scale of the system, they can reduce it to the, to the one band model. That's <clears throat> That, that's the main reason people focus on one band model and also because of a technical reason because one band model is much more difficult. Uh, three band model, high more band model is much more difficult to study. Uh, I have one question uh, just uh, regarding this uh, uh, stoner insulator and mod insulator. Yeah. So as you said that uh, for the stoner insulator, spin ordering is very important. And for the MOT, uh, hub body is important. So, but uh, if we see some materials like vanadium oxide VO2, uh, its M2 phase is considered to be a pure MOT insulator. But there we believe uh, spin ordering is very important. Even if uh, even spin ordering is playing a role. For well, what what I try to distinguish between Slater insulator and more insulator here is is that the Slater insulator mean you have some bulk symmetry. Okay. But the more insulator is not necessarily need to have bulk symmetry. You just need the formation of local moments. Strictly speaking, it's not necessary, but it can be. A Slater insulator, presumably you need the ordering. That, the, that's what distinguished them. Uh, also, is that generally true that all this interesting physics happens in a half filling uh, situation? Well, okay. Uh, Interesting thing, the most interesting thing happened near the half ring, but not half ring, because the half ring you will get, you will get anti ferromagnetic ordering, right? For this weak copper and K, you get anti ferromagnetic ordering. From the strong copper and K, you get high symbol model, so you definitely only get magnetic ordering. Uh, so the most interesting regime is called. What, what Patrick Lee has been studied for, for this label theory over eight, from nine, well, 1990 uh, is uh, they call it um, the top mod, mod the insulator. So you start from a mod insulator and then you try to dope it. And presumably this is a recipe, one of the uh, proposal of the mechanism of the high TC superconductivity. It doping the more insulator. <clears throat> it, it's not hard to understand uh, why this is the most interesting and possibly the most difficult regime. Let's say if the if the system is uh, the electrons are very far away from each other, they don't they don't see the interaction or they don't see the correlation too much. So you remain a fermi electric state. Right. So, because there are a lot of warm for the electron to move for one and they don't interact with each other. <laughs> but for near 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 the half filling, so you have some hole in the system, but not a lot. So the system the electron motion are very constrained then because there's not so many room to go on. So this is the case with which the most difficult to study because the strong correlation you find you expect it to happen. So what what is uh, the status of ferromagnetism? I, probably you can't get ferromagnetism in a single band Hubbard model, can you? Uh, so 
You mean I, I know you can get it in mean field. I, I did it in, uh, uh, but uh, it is it, actually a, 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 um, a tr truly a, a ferromagnetic uh, state in the one band Hubbard model. Uh, how, how to get ferromagnetics? I mean, one band Hubbard model. Yeah. Uh, well, that, well, to the point you can, you can prove it. <laughs> There's a mathematical proof, as I say, uh, last time. Um, you can prove that ferromagnetic ordering at, at half field, not half field, but one hole in the system at infinite U. So there's a pawn somewhere up here. I don't know whether you can see the cursor. Up here somewhere in the phase diagram near the half field, the system can be proven to be ferromagnetic ordered. Um, so I think I think the reason why you have ferromagnetic ordering is usually either the system has very strong U or a very or very highly dominant. In this case, you probably can reduce the anti-ferromagnetic ordering a lot. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes, and more interesting case, if your system has fat band, okay, the all the system here I assume you don't have a code you only have a cosine band but if you have a fat band case so you have a dispersion which is very it's, it's just flat for example some frustrated letters it's more likely to get ferromatic ordering mm -hmm. so so the face diagram you're showing here that that's uh, the and that's mean field. Yeah, you just purely mean field. Yeah, nothing else. So, what, what, uh, how, how would it look uh, for the uh, non-mean field uh, Hubbard model? Well, um, <laughs> I don't think you can do that. Um, for feed, for for half filling, sure you can do that. People do call it Monte Carlo for half filling. Uh, well, obviously you get anti ferromagnetism uh, it depends. It just depends. I mean, basically, time. my question is: what is known about the uh, what is known about the, this phase diagram for? Uh, uh, for um, so, uh, so I of. think we should. <clears throat> what is known about it? Probably we should we should go uh, go by the phase diagram. Uh, what people know is near the half wing, we expect to have spin density wave. Uh, somewhere, somewhere around maybe 20% of doping, you may get some kind of pairing. Um, you may get some superconductivity pairing. And very large doping, uh, you get an ordinary Fermi liquid. So somewhere above the superconducting phase, at let's say 20 percent, 10, 20 percent of doping, you may get something non Fermi quick. So maybe marginal Fermi quick. And this is the case for the 2D model. For the 3D model, is it less well studied at least from the model perspective? Because a lot of study are focused on 2D because they target. Most of the study are target for the Cooper way. Um, for three D, probably I don't know. You probably may not get D way super TV. I don't. I don't aware any. Uh, not not on top of my head. Any study who saw the face diagram. Mm -hmm. But I, I would guess for three D you probably don't get D way, you may only get S way battery. look at your uh, mean field uh, uh, theory uh, phase diagram. I notice that when U equals zero, uh, why it's not a symmetrical uh, Oh again, uh, the they have a small T pi. So the system is not particle symmetric. Okay. This this phase diagram at t pi equal to probably point one or point two t. 
So the dispersion is not it's not particle symmetric. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you you're you're right. Yeah, you get particle symmetric yeah, right. yeah, this is symmetric with respect to and you get one. Okay. Uh so it I I I hope we can give you some impression of uh what the what you can expect for the upper model. Uh, we talk about strong coupling K, weak coupling K, U infinity, U zero demon, at least some, hopefully it helps to get some impression what we expect to get. And the bottom line is nothing. It's not able to be studied numerically very accurately. So you can see a lot of calculation is still based on some kind of mean field calculation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That that's certainly laid foundation for us to uh, move on to uh, uh, the the uh, you know um, dynamical mean field theory. Uh, you know, certainly yeah. uh, give us yeah. That's the yeah. The dynamical mean field theory will tell you where the question mark of this figure is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Many thanks. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? I'm going to stop the recording. OK.